giving all glory and honor to God, thanking God for this majestic house, First Lubbock, thanking God for Bruce Venable and his risk of letting a brother from another mother stand in front of y'all. One more again. It's been a minute since I've been before you and there's a lot more of me to love this year. <laughs> and what's interesting is that my daughter challenged me. She said, Dad, I want to challenge you to the biggest loser. Problem, she ain't big. She don't have these big bones that I have. <laughs> this ain't fat. This is healthiness. <laughs> and when she challenged me, she said, here's the deal. We're going to remove soda from our diet. <gasps> I was praying, don't say sweet tea, don't say sweet tea. <laughs> and the girl has literally showed out. She was already rock solid. Now she's bad to the bone. But then I was rescued by the right Reverend Coleman who sent me a t-shirt and some Kool-Aid. <laughs> and when I put on this medium, cause I like the halter look, <laughs> I came out before my baby girl and said, big is the new skinny. I win. <laughs> and today I want you to know no matter where you come from, no matter how you feel, if you looked in the mirror and went, Ugh. God loves you even when your mama and them don't. And tonight is a good night for us to turn to Acts chapter 4, verses 34 through 37, to explore what it means to look divinely like who God has ordained us to be. No matter where you come from, what you've been through, what your resume says, how dark your past, what has been the skeletons in your closet, what may feel like you are not where you need to be, God says, I've got a word that will announce to you that it's well. And you trust me, when you lean not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge me, you can declare tonight, if you got a pimple and a date on the horizon, that it's well. If you're a fella in the room and nobody's giving you the time of day, it's well. This word is going to be supercalifragilisticexpialidocious tonight so that we will know that God has our best interest in mind. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, you look good for a change. <laughs> it's well. When peace like a river attended my way When sorrows like sea For 
there was not a needy person among them. When it's well with your soul, you can turn inside the word and discover why it's good to the last drop. This is better than Desperate Housewives. <laughs> Need to tune in because the word says in Acts 4, 34 through 37, that was not a needy person among them because all those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds to the, the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. The scripture then says, this was then distributed to each person as anyone had a need. Joseph, a Levite and a Cypriote by birth, whom the apostles called Barnabas. Somebody shout Barnabas. Barnabas. Why did they call him that? Simply because he was a son of encouragement. He sold his field, the field he owned, bought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And tonight I want to talk about extraordinary. You came in the building extra ordinary. And God looked to the top of the balcony and to the front row and he said, what feels real extra ordinary, when it's yielded in my hands, I will make extraordinary. I'm the only one feeling this message. I brought my own amens. Amen. Preach, Mike. The word. <laughs> In the Bible, I love the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. It's the B-I-B-L-E. Why should we trust? Why should we consult? Why should we turn to the pages of scripture? If you've got a word, look again in Acts chapter four. You look here because unlike any other book, the Bible can be trusted. It's active, it's living, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Coleman, it divides soul and spirit. It gets to the rooty tooty. And it searches you out from head to toe and it discerns your motivation. You can fool me all day long. You can look like you too sexy for yourself. But when the veil is removed, God sees your heart and it's U-G-L-Y. You don't have no alibi. You ugly. <laughs> Woo. Look at your neighbor. Real ugly. <laughs> See, y'all didn't even pray. Y'all need to pray again. The proof in the word, even in a passage and text, says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Now that is phenomenal when the word can become flesh. Some of you have word that hits people upside the head because it's halitosis. Bad breath but not this Bible. It is a word that is eternal. And when you see the word living, the word equates itself to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So when we run out of gas, we come to paradigm, we start the semester off right, then midway, we forget what we were told by God and have spiritual amnesia. And God says, come back to my truth. And the truth shall set you free. And whom the Son is set free. He or she is free indeed. I'm the only one excited. The word shows me that the Bible can be trusted. And what I love so much about the Bible is that it's God's word about himself to us. Can't get it anywhere else. Oprah can't give it to you. Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz, and all the others you consult. Some of you camp out with preachers you adore and elevate and pedestal and God says, look again, I am above and beyond what you ever fathomed possible. I will do exceedingly abundantly above what you can imagine or even try and explain. I love that about the word, but can I tell you what I love most? Come here. What I love about the Bible is what's done in the Bible cannot stay in the Bible. Do I have to say Vegas? What's done in Vegas? I pray tonight at First Lubbock in Paradigm, what's done in here does not stay in here because you get a case of the can't help it, the word inside of you hidden in your heart so you may not sin against God. It's like fire shut up in my bones. And that's Barnabas who helps us retain extract as well as apply the word. God gives us a character because many of us are like dumb sheep. It goes in one ear and out the other. We need some visual aid and God says, Barnabas, 
Why would we consult him? Because he's extraordinary, just like you and me. Now, there's somebody in the room who thinks the axis of the universe revolves around you. I ain't talking to you. I'm talking about the rest of us who feel ordinary. <laughs> Can I see some hands? Just an ordinary, ho-hum, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. God says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you won't just get rest when you consult the word for your physical body, but you will get rest for your soul. Like never before, we will see how God can take extra ordinary people and when they submit and yield their lives through the gospel truth will do extraordinary things by the power of the most high God. This power packed message is designed to prepare all who jacked up 2011 for a better 2012. I said something right there. You know you blew it. Got the grades to prove it. And God says, that's why I gave you 2012, so you can have a do-over. <laughs> and this word says, it was ordinary last year, but come unto me and you will experience extraordinary things. Are you ready? I found the character. His name is Barnabas. You can extract from the word. You can retain the word. You can actually apply scripture tonight if you've never opened a Bible before in life because Barnabas, like us, has something we can relate to. He emerges from the scripture in Acts chapter 4, verses 34 through 37, as one of us, an ordinary person. But one whom we can find truth from. How is he ordinary? He was not Jesus. He was ordinary. Jesus is the word. He was not even Paul, who consulted the word to get the word and then write the word. But what I love about an ordinary guy like Barnabas, he brings us a word through his name. Why do you say that? Because an ordinary man as he was, Barnabas gives us a word wrapped in his name and what his name has come to characterize. Shout Barnabas. From the first appearance in Acts 4, what set Barnabas apart and should motivate us tonight to do this semester the way God has ordained is he had been given a name that stands for something. I can relate to that. My mama name named me Michael Satterfield. And I don't say that to get you to know who I am. I'm just telling you Michael is a name that is defined scripturally as one who's like the Lord. Thanks, Mom. Every day, I got to press and strive to be one like the Lord because that's what they named me. <laughs> but they didn't stop there. Michael Satterfield. Satterfield, I hail from San Antonio, Texas. I live in Birmingham, Alabama. But as a San Antonian, the Satterfields were noted for being loyal, noted for being handsome, Denzel-like. <laughs> Give me something, y'all. They were noted for being those who were hard workers. And every now and then I'd sit in a classroom, as many of you sit in, and the roll would be called, and someone would say, Scattis Berry, wouldn't answer to that. Satter White, wouldn't answer to that, because that was not my name, and to boot, the Satter Whites, I hope the kinfolk ain't here today, were known in San Antonio for being scoundrels and thieves. You don't call me Satter White, because I'm a Satter Field. Hallelujah, amen. I got a name that stands for something. Do you? Barnabas is here in the text, and the scripture says his name means something. He has a character, and what I love about it is that it's not a self-promoted name. Some of y'all call yourselves Hercules, and you're about that big. I got a cousin who Facebooked me and wanted me to let the world know she's my cousin and on my Facebook page she has Sandra, she's so hot, Satterfield. <laughs> Guess what she's not? Hot. <laughs> <laughs> But we give ourselves a name that doesn't even apply to who we are, and this word shows me that this man in Scripture was not self-promoted. He was not self-inflated. Instead, in Scripture, Barnabas is synonymous with servant. Barnabas, though ordinary, was one others wanted to follow. 
Barnabas, though ordinary, was one that others could trust. Barnabas, though ordinary, was one whose counsel was sought. Barnabas, though ordinary, was one who others looked to in times of recession, in times of division, in times of crisis, in times where haterade is the flavor of the day. But Barnabas comes to us and he begs us to pause, put a pen right in the passage and ask ourselves, self, right now, do others want to follow me? Things that make you go, hmm. Self, am I trustworthy? Self, would my counsel be sought after? And if it was, should they listen? Self, Am I someone others look for in times of trouble and division or do they hide from me in Walmart, aisle six? This word says to me, I must ask, do I even want to be followed? When you have a name like Barnabas and this name is placed in scripture strategically, you understand that when the church was in diapers, the church was just in pull-ups, the church was in infantile state, Barnabas arose out of the infancy and through an ordinary life, a man comes to greet us with his influence because he didn't seek the high place, he didn't seek to be on stage, he didn't seek to be noted and patted on the back. He was not looking for applause, Hercules, Hercules, he was one who was in the midst of the passage made prominent by his peers when people see you can they say your name used to be Joseph by birth you were a Cypriot from Cyprus but when I look closely at you you are a son or daughter of encouragement to me you are always someone who changes the atmosphere into that which is more winsome when you come into the room you come in and you command attention not to look at me, myself, and I, but you come in saying, ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party won't stop. You are an air traffic controller who points to the heavenly throne and you acknowledge that he's real and a rewarder of those who diligently seek his face. Can I ask you, are you a Barnabas? Barnabas steps onto the plate and he says, I'll give guidance, I'll give encouragement. Barnabas was not self-made, he was God-made. Bless you. I love the Bible. And being God-made, he moved from an extraordinary life, surrendered into the hands of the matchless king to become extraordinarily used by him. You, first Lubbock, and all who attend Paradigm, and those from campuses across, those who intermingle with other extra biblical entities, those who have come as a last ditch effort to allow tonight to be your catalyst, to push you pressing into a new year in such a way you'll never ever ever be the same. You who are here ought to be those who serve notice to the world that I am in a missionary movement that brings the gospel to the world like a Barnabas and you are those who are attracted in. Why is Barnabas important? Because he was a Cypriot and connected to the Jewish nation, the chosen people who helped get Gentiles into the kingdom. I'm in! Because Barnabas stood up and fought the good fight of faith on my behalf. So when you're seeking to be somebody who has a name that stands for something, can I see your hand? Don't you want to be somebody whose marquee, whose epitaph, whose grave marker reads, it mattered I lived? Or do you just want to skate through life by the hair of your chinny chin chin? I'm looking at you and somebody's saying, dude, yeah. <laughs> Wrong! You ought to be different to make a difference. And to be a person like Barnabas, you know when you hear his name, you're dealing with someone, number one, if you're writing, a person who knows how to lift others up. That's number one. Barnabas spent time around his peers living out the character of a brand new name associated with him. He was a son of exhortation. And I messed around and stayed up late enough one night to scroll through television and landed upon the comedian Steve Harvey interviewing Bishop T.D. Jakes. Now this 
message in this tidbit is not a tribute to my theology concerning those guys, but I learned something about what it means to lift others up. Has anyone ever been up so late you turned the TV in? That was this brother. And they were in an interview, and when T.D. Jakes was asked, what makes someone extraordinary? He said, being Christian. And then Steve leaned in and he asked, what makes a person Christian? I love this. If you're gonna lift somebody else up, T.D. Jakes said, my sister taught me a long time ago. A Christian is just a beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Oh, y'all missed it. I'm 250 pounds dripping wet. If I put my name on leftovers in the refrigerator and you eat them, Houston, <laughs> it's going down. <laughs> Grab on. <laughs> I will bite your ear like Mike Tyson if you take my stuff. <laughs> but not a real Christian. <laughs> Repent, I'm doing that right now. Because if I'm a beggar and I'm hungry and I know where the bread is, chances are, I got to tell y'all where it is too. <laughs> It's all about lifting up. The word doesn't stop there. That's another aspect of being a Barnabas. One who is one who lifts another up. Number B, a person who's like Barnabas is one who spends his or her time being generous. Say generous. He did not avoid the Salvation Army bell ringer when they entered the door at Walmart. Some of y'all tuck and go to the other door. Because you don't want to put change. It's ing ling bing a ling a ling ling You're like, oh, no, not today. You walk right past them like they don't exist. Not Barnabas. He put change going in, and he put change coming out. He was generous in the old aspect of this entry. We find in the New Testament infantile state of the church. He was one of the first financial supporters. And I know many of you are broke as the Ten Commandments. You don't have a dime. To your, your account is past red. But Barnabas says, I'm going to support self-sacrificially. I'm going to give until it feels good. You're asked to give, to participate, to go on mission, to be a part of paradigm, to push the mobilization of the gospel all around Lubbock into Texas and the uttermost parts of the world. And many of you won't go to the next dorm room and give someone a cup of sugar. For me, it was ramen noodles. But you are those who are in the midst called on to do something that is beyond your comfort zone, generosity. Why is that so important? Because Dietrich Bonhoeffer, theologian and martyr, said something significant. He helps me determine what it looks like to be generous. He takes us from extraordinary to extraordinary living by saying these words. Bonhoeffer teaches, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Now this is not a dead martyr's word about physical death. This is actually Christ himself calling us to his very essence of Christian living. He says to us, you must spiritually die. A Galatians 2.20 kind of call. When I've been crucified with Christ, I no longer live. The life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. He paid it all and all to him I owe. You don't understand. Sin left a crimson stain, but he washed it and made me white as do you know how much cleansing that is for a black brother? <laughs> it's not just an outer appearance, it's an inward glow and his light shines when I become like he's called me to be and men see good works and they don't give me acclaim, they glorify God in heaven. So when you look at this, for others to follow and trust us, for others to seek our counsel out, for others to see us effectively as we should be ones who are believed because our word is bond. As others see us apply the word and then put it in shoe leather and walk it out. They want to be those who have a case of the cane help it's with us. We must die to our innate selfishness and become a Barnabas. When? Today is a good day. 
At the close of our time together, I didn't come to talk at you. This is a healthy dialogue. And you must get up off your blessed assurance and come to an altar and surrender how much? That's a healthy investment. That's risky business because people will watch you come out of your row, step over them to an altar, and they'll say, mm -hmm. see how long this altar hug will last. But tonight, you've got to get serious and then bring your issue to the altar. Nothing magical up here, is there, Bruce? But it's something about taking a step of faith, saying, no matter who's watching, no matter what the cost, I'm moving forward to get my liberty. And my living will no longer be in vain. I gotta die to self. Barnabas teaches me that believers are sharers. Listen, the proceeds that came from his cell of his own property were laid and distributed, and no one was needy as a result. And when you hear the name Barnabas, you're dealing with one, lifting others up, being generous. And number three, he's courageous. Oh, now that's an altar call. Someone right now is walking in trepidation. Someone right now has taken their fingernails and bit them to the nub from nerves. Someone right now knows that you can't afford to pay attention. And so you are one in need of a miracle and you must make your way and bend your knee and say, God, here am I. Take all of me until there's nothing left of me and do what you will through my life. That takes courage because Barnabas defended a convicted murderer by the name of Paul. He took Paul, called him Christian, and then introduced him to other Christians who didn't trust Paul. They knew Paul was a Christian killer. And there was no way they were just going to automatically embrace this dude. But Barnabas says he's trustworthy. Barnabas said, I'll take it up a notch. You know me as a son of encouragement. Yes, we do. I've invited Paul to be with me as I escort him on the first missionary journey to Asia Minor. This is huge. He went with a convicted murderer who was knocked off his beast on the Damascus road and transformed in the twinkling of an eye. Once lost, now saved. Once blind, now seen. One who now knows that Jesus is the reason that we live, move, and have our being. Barnabas says that Paul, that murderer, is trustworthy. Then he goes into Acts chapter 15 and he participates in the council in Jerusalem defending the Gentile what did he say you don't have to be cut on to be a Christian oh somebody should have shouted and turned a backflip right there <laughs> circumcision is not a necessary entry into the way of Christianity believe on the name Jesus Christ the one who came in the form of a servant in the likeness of men and humbled himself even to death on an old rugged cross. But he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand and he became our triumphant hero of the text. Not about Barnabas, all about Jesus. And when we find him, Barnabas says, don't cut your flesh, cut open your heart and allow God to come marching in. And when the king comes marching, who is the king of glory? The Lord God strong and mighty. I'm the only one know what I'm saying tonight. When you've got the king on your side, who can be against you? A Barnabas says, I've got him. I got him. I got him. I know I got him. <laughs> and I know that that brings courage. Why is it courageous? Because he stood, he stood up to Paul when Paul didn't believe John Mark was good for the journey. And that's courageous because Paul could have had amnesia and a flashback and went back on a killer Christian mission but Barnabas says I'm standing I stood for you Paul and I stand for John Mark and then Paul came around and recognized here is courage when you take your selfish ambition and no longer seek to rise above other people instead you lift them up when you take your selfish behavior to get what you want when you 
want it and say, I scratched that, now I'm generous and I want to esteem others higher than myself. When you take your selfish attitude and then you start caring about others more than you care for you, you become those who participate in the kingdom's plan. You take your selfish desires to put your need first above anyone else's and you begin to ponder, if I deny myself, then I'm not saying no to me, I'm saying yes to the Savior. And only what we do for Christ will ever last. Is there a Barnabas in the house? Because when you lift others and you become generous and you get courage in your DNA, you become like the young man who's held from Chicago, D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody heard in a preaching session just like this one, a preacher declare the world has yet to see what will happen when one man's heart is completely God's. And Moody raised his hand and said, I want to be that man. He became Barnabas-like and he said, though extraordinary, he was impoverished. He was not well educated, but Moody had a God who owns cattle on a thousand hills, who will open up a window, pour out a blessing. None of us have room enough to receive. And Moody said, I'll be the one who surrenders everything and I'll take the message to the highways and hedges and compel those who know him not to come. What was the result of Moody becoming Barnabas-like? The result was 30,000 young men and women like you and like me who become a part of a global mission move taking Jesus' name to places that had never seen a foreigner. His heart was sold out and completely the property of Jesus Christ. You've given your heart to a pookie, to somebody horizontally, and God says when you only love horizontally, you're like two ticks without a dog. You've got to have a vertical in order to establish that there is juice in the midst of your walk of faith. A Barnabas is that man, that woman who says I'm connected vertically and now I know how to march it out horizontally. A person who lifts others up, a person who's generous, a person who is courageous. And this last thing, I love it, I love it. When you are like Barnabas, out of Acts chapter 4, out of Acts 15, out of the whole Acts ministry, you become those whose walk with God is so evident that everybody who passes by you sees your love affair with the king. What are you saying to us, Mike? Barnabas is called a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith in Acts 11, 24. Barnabas says he was one who was the first disciple from Jerusalem called Christian at Antioch. His life was evident. To how many people? All. Oh, you can't be a shower Christian. You can't reserve Thursday nights only. God wants you either hot or cold. All of his are not at all because you can't be halfway pregnant. Can I get a witness? When you're pregnant, it changes everything. You can't wear the same clothes. You can't go to the same places. You cannot smell the same fragrances. When you're pregnant, your life is utterly transformed. And when the seed of the word is deposited inside of you, you are impregnated with God's purpose, his mandate, his will, and nothing more will satisfy. When you walk so close to God, your walk is evident and people will take notice. You remind me of somebody, cousin it, no, Bubba, no. You remind me of Jesus. Y'all missed it, let me say it this way. A little girl helps you know what it looks like. In order for God to walk so close to you intimately, everybody notices. She came home from Sunday school. You know, that's that early Sunday morning activity that many churches participate in. You might call it small group. You may call it facilitation group. I don't care what you call it, but she came home distraught, just crying. Her mom grabbed her. What is wrong, pumpkin? They told me at church, God is big. And her mom said, that's right. Did they say anything else? Apostate? Heresy? I don't know what you mean, mama, but they said, God is big. And then her mom inquired deeper. Why are you so upset? If God is big, 
shouldn't he be poking out? Y'all will catch that tomorrow at lunch. Because I'm looking around this campus and I don't see a lot of God poking out of a lot of people. Is he? If you're a Barnabas, your life is so evident that he, he cannot be contained inside of you. Folk will say, just poking out of your life in the way you smile. You may not be able to raise capital campaign funds, but you can grin with 32 teeth or however many you got. And it will enliven the act. Have you ever seen an old person with one tooth grin? It changes everything. Just, ah, ah. Look at her. God says, whatever you got, offer it, and it will change what happens in the atmosphere, though very extraordinary. Life, when you give it to God, becomes extraordinary. Dr. Fred Craddock, and I'm done. Bandy Distinguished Professor of Preaching and New Testament Emeritus at Emory School of Theology, that Candor School of Theology, Emory University, hot now, Georgia. He said he was in the Appalachians as a pastor and he went to Watts Bar Lake between Chattanooga and Knoxville, Tennessee. And he discovered something. He discovered this Acts 4 passage. He found out that on an Easter baptismal ceremony, which was their custom, those members who came to know Jesus and became like Barnabas, surrendered, and everything they had became God's, he found out that they would be brought to the center of a fireside circle. And in the center of the circle, their names would be announced. And surrounding them would be all of the church members. Check this out. When the church members surrounded these and the names of the new converts were called, then each church member would echo their name and a promise. One church member would say, my name is Hezekiah Walker and I want you to know that I will cut your grass for you if ever you need it. Another would say, my name is Priscilla and if you ever need someone who can babysit, I'll be ready for you. Someone else would chime in, my name is Elizabeth and if you need someone who knows how to iron, come see me. What are you saying, preacher? In that Appalachian country, rural, poor church, there was not a needy person among them because the whole congregation says, here am I, send me. And such that I have, I offer. Silver and gold have I none, but I give you the very best of me. And you will never be without because I am now a part of your faith. Are you a Barnabas? You came tonight needing permission to say such that I have, I can give that. I may not be a superstar like those who stood on stage and led us in that phenomenal worship experience, but I know that I can be one who can bend the knee and tie a shoestring. I want you to be those who tonight find a sheet of paper and write on that sheet of paper, I thank God every time I remember you and put in a name. Each of us has a Barnabas and you need to write the name. Why? Because when they precede you in glory, they will welcome you into the kingdom, helping you see that because they were in your life, you became one who desired more of God just by them being present in your experience. And if you in this room, on your sheet of paper, with a blank there, cannot put I thank God every time I remember the name Jesus, you are the first I invite to the altar. Because you're announcing I've heard of him, heard you preach about him tonight, but I don't know him well enough to thank God every time I hear his name. And that was a woman whom a young guy in the barbershop told me about. Yeah, I go to the barbershop. They don't have to do much. But what they do allows me to look drop dead gorgeous. <laughs> but this young man said, my mom has Alzheimer's. She cannot remember my name. Preacher, she cannot remember the names of my sisters. When we go visit my mom, as the worship team comes back up, she then will exchange our names for other people's names who are long gone and dead. He said, and I 
I'm heartbroken. My mother with Alzheimer's has forgotten who she gave birth to. He said, but preacher, didn't you say you're talking about Barnabas? Yeah. Well, I asked her something. What did you ask her? Didn't you say something about extraordinary? Yeah. I asked her, who makes you extraordinary? Who is it that brought you from death to life? Who is it that moved you from darkness into the marvelous light of your existence? Who is it that saved you from danger seen and unseen? And my mother, who cannot remember anybody else's name, says, Jesus, the son of the living God, with Alzheimer's, when Jesus has entered your life, you can never ever forget the stamp he's put upon you. If you can't get to Barnabas, you better run to Jesus because he will escort you into the promised land of eternity. Every day will not be about how big, how skinny, how tall, how short. Every day will be howdy, howdy. And the Sabbath rest will have no end. Do you have the name that stands for everything? Every head bowed. Jesus brings you to lift others. He brings you to the place of generosity. He escorts you to be those who get courage just because you've got his name which is above all other names. I love the Bible. I love Barnabas. But it's something about the name Jesus that makes everything else minute in all that he is supernaturally extraordinary. He can help you. Walk so close to his father, our God, that he pokes out. As this worship team challenges us in song and ushers us into continued worship, maybe you're in the room and you will admit tonight, you know what, I don't lift others up. I came to college in order to find myself and that's all it's been about is myself. But tonight, Acts 4 teaches me about a selfless pursuit that warms the soul and I don't want to leave here without it if that's you I'm inviting you to come down to this altar your right my far left and some folk are gonna meet you down here and just pray with you you may not even know what to ask God for how do I get out of selfishness to selflessness I don't know and God is inviting you to come get it right someone else you're not generous stingy is your middle name and right here at the altar, you can find the great I am who supplies all you need. He blesses you to be a blessing. Someone else, no courage. You're afraid of your shadow. And God says, not when I'm on your side. Greater is he that is within you than anybody you face who's a hater in your world. From the balcony, you need to start making your way. And I don't get extra points if you come or you don't. But you get a closer relationship when you start pressing toward the God of glory. Someone else, your walk is not evident. You hide so that no one really knows you're trying to find and walk and pursue newness of life. But tonight, you are daring to make a declaration, I'm going to be so different. They see God drip from my pores. They see him evident in my attitude. I'm failing the class like everybody else, but I'm grinning because the class does not define my identity. Jesus does. And I'm coming to a right relationship with him. I'm done, but the Holy Spirit is still speaking. Others have already made bold steps of faith toward the altar. Don't you wait and miss your blessing tonight. Because the God I serve is able 
to do more than you ever thought possible for extraordinary people like you and me. Come, let us worship that love affair because of the lover of our soul bidding us come. <laughs>